When you buy a cup of coffee, the chances are you might tip the barista. Think of me as that barista, but rather than a hot cup of coffee, I hand you a perfectly wrapped hour of World War II enjoyment. There are numerous costs that I incur each month in the process of putting together the show, and that's before I factor in the time it takes to produce the podcast. As such, I make less than minimum wage. So the next time you take a sip of your coffee, think of me and go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast and sign up to make a small monthly donation. A dollar or two from all of you goes a long way to helping me produce the show. And I do try to give something back to those who support the show by way of releasing podcast extras, off-topic conversation that might have come up in the process of recording the interview. So to help the show, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or ww2podcast.com and click on donate. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. We're looking at amphibious operations during the war in this episode. Until I started researching, I hadn't realised how many there were. We're all very familiar with the handful in the European theatre, but in the Pacific, the list is very long. And in many cases, the men taking part will be veterans of numerous assault landings. In this episode, I'm talking to Mike Walling. Mike is the author of Blood Stained Sands, US Amphibious Operations in World War II. He's a veteran of the US Navy Coast Guard and has spent the last 40 years collecting stories from veterans. Thanks for joining me. Um, I was staggered at the number of operations made. Um, it certainly, it was landing after landing in the Pacific. But I wonder, pre-war in the US, how much effort had been put into uh, thinking about amphibious assault landings? Actually, quite a bit. The Marines started it in, one of the Marines started in 1922, 23, recognizing that Japan would be the enemy. So their whole mentality was geared toward protecting the Pacific bases we had, and if necessary, taking other ones by assault and building up support troops, landing craft that would do the job. They had what they called flex, fleet exercises, every year, every few years here. And then they also had our equivalent ones over in the Pacific, usually on the West Coast and then eventually out in Hawaii. And this all began to ramp up more quickly as Japan became more militant, Germany became militant. So by 1938, 39, Things began to move in higher gear, but the basic procedures had been laid down, the protocol. So it was just a matter of refining it and then developing the, the landing craft necessary to move the men and equipment quickly and efficiently from ships to shore. Uh, one of the, the things that I had learned very early on was they used a lot of Coast Guardsmen from the life-saving stations, the surfmen, because the Coast Guard knew how to run boats through the surf. This is not something the Navy practices. So they'd bring the, the coxswains down, the motor machinist mates, the motor max. And the new river exercises in 41, September 41, was the first time that they really put into effect everything that would be used later on in the war. They had the first, of the, well, the Higgins boats, uh, LCPs, landing craft personnel. And they also had the first of the uh, Roebling's LVTs. And they basically handed the Higgins boats to the Coast Guard and said, here, you go running through the surf and we'll take notes. But there had been a lot of thought, a lot of discussion, really going back at that point, probably close to 16, 17 years on the part of at least the Marines and eventually the Army. Yeah, and I, I guess the the big breakthrough for what we're thinking of, uh, you know, a beach an amphibious assault must have been the Higgins boats. It was. And then what happened was apparently someone, one of the Marines said, hey, look, the Japanese have ramps on them. What can we do? So Andrew Jackson Higgins went back and started putting ramps on them. That's where we have the LCVPs, the landing craft vehicle personnel, which are the ones you always see, the you know the very dramatic ramp drops. Somebody runs off you know, to the beach and mostly got shot up, but this is how they got ashore. They also developed equivalent landing craft for tanks, LCTs, on and on. The big LSTs, the large landing ship tanks, also known as large slow targets, evolved 42, or actually into 43, uh, initially sort of a British concept, 
but the Americans, being the way they are, took it, ran with it, and developed a unique piece of equipment. Higgins, uh, is it, I think it was Higgins Industries, is that what it was called? But it was an enormous, I, think, I have a funny feeling it was one of the biggest, ended up being one of the biggest companies in the US at the close of the war, and then it almost instantly went almost bankrupt, didn't it? Uh, well, it did, because, number one, there were so many of the boats laying around that who was going to buy a new one? You had thousands upon thousands of these landing craft of different sizes and configurations that were in perfectly good shape that the military certainly didn't need anymore. And there, there wasn't much of a pleasure boat industry. And the work boat industry didn't need it because they had all these leftover landing craft. So he basically wound up folding his folding his tents pretty early on. I don't remember exactly when, but it was it was it was too bad. But that's what happened. Were those Higgins boats really as ubiquitous as all the films would make you see? I mean, was it was every landing and just involve I would say hundreds, but you know, an enormous amount of them? To answer your question, yes, uh, they were adopted by the British. The British had a, a landing craft infantry, an LCI, I think it is, that was actually a little bit smaller and had edges on it. wasn't quite as flexible. Yeah, everybody, everybody was using the LCVPs, and they used them. As far as I know, pretty much every landing starting early on in North Africa, they had some early models in Guadalcanal, but I think most of those were the earlier versions of the LCPs, which were round bows and didn't have the ramps. But they are, and literally, yeah. They were all over the place. Am I correct in saying they made of plywood? They were. <laughs> which is remarkable, because in the films you always think of the... Yeah. Uh, you know, hiding be- uh, behind the you know the bow before it goes down, but presumably they'd be just the ramp was steel. Oh, okay, the ramp was steel. The side was wood, and the men would carry a, a selection of tapered plugs. So you just put them in, hammer them in, and plug the book, plug up, plug up the shot holes. It must have been absolutely frightening. You sat there plugging holes as you're as you're, as you're essentially what must feel like a sinking ship if you're not used to uh, sailing. Well, the coxswain the coxswain stood up straight. He didn't have any protection in front of him. And they usually mounted a couple of 50 caliber machine guns in the back. Maybe you had splinter shields and the machine guns, but there was no, they weren't in armored turrets at all. Prior to, uh, I mean, I guess the, bi- the big allied, in, uh, the large amphibious landings are sort of the first ones at Guadalcanal and Torch. But I wonder, I wonder if uh, before those had been made, the, obviously the British had tried at Dieppe. Uh, which had been a miserable failure. The Germans had made some. Um, I wonder if anyone had studied those before uh, Guadalcanal and, and Torch and actually sort of uh, learned anything from them. They learned from Dieppe, but Guadalcanal was a throw together. It was called Operation Shoestring. The Japanese were there. Uh, they were, had a seaplane base on Tulagi, which was long range, and were actually able to bomb Australia, and they were interdicting the uh, some of the shipping lanes. So they had to throw it together. The only reason the Marines went in first is because MacArthur didn't have enough Army personnel. And they went in August 8th and 42. Japanese came down the next day, and all the supply ships split. So these guys were left out, hanging out to dry. But it was pretty small landing. And I'm going to sidetrack a little bit on Guadalcanal. Everybody says, well, Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal. Well, the Guadalcanal landing itself was real simple. I think one guy cut his palm when he's opening coconut. However... Across the the inlet or the you know the bay, Tulagi, Florida, and Gavutu were brutal. We took a large number of casualties. Basically, wiped out uh, the Marine paratroop divisions that landed through the landing craft. Did a large number on some of the raiders. The, you always see Guadalcanal. You don't talk about Tulagi, Gavutu, and Florida, but, but those were really horrendously costly battles for about three days. What did they learn from the Dieppe? Not to go into cities. That was that was one of Churchill's experiments. I'll leave it at that. Dieppe, truly a debacle. I, I just wonder if they learned anything from the ship to shore uh, aspect of it, because it's very confused. Some of it. The Americans had it down pretty well at that point. And trying to place when was Dieppe? I know it was the summer of forty two. I but Guadalcanal was was unique in the, the in and of itself because that was actually the first. I don't remember, even though I wrote about it, the carryover into Dieppe, but I do know there was a big carryover from not only Dieppe, but a lot of the people, a lot of the men involved in the amphibious operations and the planning from Guadalcanal were brought over to help train and then oversee and be involved with the torch, the American torch landings. Uh, so that was the direct carryover. Dieppe was, 
it was mostly what not to do. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because they all sort of actually happened very quickly. So Dieppe is August, your torch is uh, November, and Guadalcanal is before that. So, you know, it, it is very much, it's all right, right to think, let, you know, well, they had time to think about it, but it's all very much happening in quite a compressed period of time. Yeah, they actually did have time to pick up the lessons learned at Guadalcanal. But Guadalcanal, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at it, was a comparatively small operation. Some of the techniques were good. What they learned was beach control, which was a total disaster on Guadalcanal. Uh, you know, getting supplies in, getting them off the beach. They learned the real learning curve came at North Africa where the first of the American beach, but U.S. beach battalions were there. So they did some pretty good lessons learned pretty quickly, you know, like a three or four month span between uh, Guadalcanal and uh, Torch with Dieppe thrown into, okay, let's not go after a reinforced position in a city. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I was say, look, looking at Torch. Torch is interesting because it's, it's, it's the, the, the European ones, the European uh, landings are all uh, allied landings, whereas in the Pacific they're very much more American operations. Um, and I wondered, I wondered actually if that should in the way that the – operations were planned so in torch uh you have those uh raids trying to secure harbors which struck me as not necessarily american thinking but much more churchillian will sneak a little party into well to yeah the algiers landings which were oh yeah we'll use a couple of former american coast guard cutters that maybe the french will think are harmless and he sends them into an enclosed harbor the other thing, the execution on that, to the uh, Iran Harbor, I'm sorry, the first ship didn't line up properly. So, having alerted everybody and his brother, he turns around and starts in again, which probably was not the best decision based on available information. They wanted the harbor. Well, they didn't get it until the, they took it from the land side, and they lost a lot of people, including a large portion of uh uh, American, a battalion of uh, Americans from the 2nd Armored, without any armor, and there were also 30 U.S. Marines involved in that. It may be well planned, but it was certainly not well executed. Executed. But Torch is interesting as well, because it's a huge area that they attempt to, uh, I say area, because they make three landings, but they're very well sp spread out. I don't think we replicate such huge uh, area that we land on again. No, no, we don't. People use Normandy and say D-Day, D-Day, D-Day. I'm Sorry, I have a bad reaction. It's all oh, D-Day. I'm sorry. Okay, no, it's, let me tell you about the elements. But Torch, you know, covered from the southwestern coasts of French Morocco a third of the way to Egypt. They had three major task force. Each task force had three sub-task force. There were nine different landings, literally simultaneously. And what most people don't realize is the Americans went in against the Vichy French. We weren't fighting the Germans. And the only people that didn't fight us were the French Foreign Legion. For, for such a huge area, there were it was a success. But I mean, how much did they? You know, I got the feeling even Torch was kind of uh, the, the the planning was scant, believing believing it would be possibly easier than it was. Looking at what I read about Torch, which was primarily from the American side at this point, I mean, I have to go back and read Roscoe again. I thought it was overall well coordinated. The commanders were very experienced. You know, the task force commanders, there was really good command and control for air ground support. They put everybody in one basket. OK, you had Eisenhower. Then you had who was it? Was it, it wasn't Tedder who was in charge of the Air Force, but they had an RAF, you know, on and on. So what they did was they really had good people to handle the coordination of the different aspects of of the operation. The British had very successful landings. The American, there was some American, um, there was a mixed American and British task force, I think, in the center, and they did a good job with that. So I think overall, they did well. The problem was that Kesselring was put in charge of the overall defense, and the Americans sort of sat on their thumbs, saying, hey, look, we're great, very inexperienced. Germans flew an immense number of reinforcements and hammered the Americans at the Kazarine Pass. You know, the Germans will never be able to do this. No, the Germans did this and did it very effectively and put it against a really green American army. Meanwhile, Montgomery is and crew are romping west 
and the British forces in the center are doing pretty well. So it was the Americans on the east, on the west coast, that really held up the operation. Do you think the light, uh, the, uh, light resistance? The, the, I was, if not light resistance, the success uh, perhaps allowed them to be over, overly bombastic for when it came to Husky, which was frankly much more problematic. Well, Husky, Husky was interesting because yeah, I think they got too complex. And again, what you got into was the the real first run of Montgomery versus Patton, which is a problem in and of itself. Husky, besides the storm where everybody got seasick, the command and control was abominable. From running paratroops in to the British losing some major supply ships, that the Canadians lost their you know all their trucks. Uh, the timing on reinforcements was bad. I met a, a man who had been the gunnery officer on an American LST the morning that there was a German air raid. And meanwhile, somebody had scheduled to drop paratroopers, you know, towing gliders, whole bit. And I asked this gentleman many years ago, and he said, I can't tell you how many Germans I shot down, but I can tell you how many Americans we did. Once they got sorted out after the first 72 hours, yeah, they did pretty well. But nobody got around and, and nobody thought, apparently, and this is all money boarding quarterbacking 70 some odd years later, why they didn't put a heavy naval task force between the northeast corner of Sicily and Italy, I have no idea. Because all the Germans just bailed out. It strikes me with, 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 with the landing, with, with you know, amphibious landings in general, it actually, the bigger problem is not so much getting the first waves ashore, it's organising your subsequent waves so they actually either arrive on time or they get what they need in the order that they need it. Well, that's where the beach battalions came in in the Atlantic. Very efficient units. They had hydrographic units. They had repair units for the boats, uh, medical signal Good command and control, beach masters, good, again, communications. Part of it was you're dealing with people that probably never handled so much as an outboard motorboat running these LCVPs. And Torch, the American landings, the first wave about wiped out all their landing craft from running them up on the beach, you know, rough landings. Husky was much the same point in a lot of areas. And, then, of course, the Germans were having all kinds of fun. The Luftwaffe was real close by, and they were on top of the situation pretty quickly. And we had problems getting air cover over there. So getting the waves in, getting the beaches clear, getting the successive waves in and running them up the beach has always been a problem. And I don't recall many landings. There's some in the Pacific, excuse me, or specifically in the Southwest Pacific, where it went pretty smoothly. But the half a dozen major landings, except southern France, Every one of them ran into problems. You do hear stories on D-Day, you know, of crowding of be- your posts, crowding of beaches and... You know, people getting their food in the when they wanted ammunition, and it must have been almost impossible because presumably the commanders on the ships are almost blind. Once once the hour to start happens, the commanders on the ships must almost have no idea what's hap- what's occurring. Normandy, everybody talks about the American beach at Omaha, or what the airborne troops went in and the problems they had dropping into flooded areas, pilots speeding up from, you know, by 25 knots and dumping them way out of place. They talk occasionally about the uh, rangers at Point du Hoc. They don't talk about Utah, which went pretty well. And in this country, you never hear about Sword, Gold, or Juno, which were, some of them were as bad, if not worse, than Omaha. So we have, not surprisingly, a, a really distorted sense of the landing there, there were two Coast Guard manned LCIs, and uh, I think it was Easy Red on Omaha, that were dropping troops, and they, were, they got mortared. They got massacred, you know, and you only see these guys drop the ramps and run ashore. Mm, no, the, probably the closest we ever came to reality was, was Cornelius Ryan's Longest Day, that movie. Crap, I was like 15 years old when I saw it, so it gives you how old it is. But that was the most accurate of all the movies. You know, there's no concept of what it was like, the sheer terror of it. I, I was meaning to rewatch the intro to, to, to the, long, the landers in the longest day. I, didn't, I, I got sidetracked into watching uh, Saving Private Ryan, that opening sequence. I, I actually you know, made a note of, uh, you know, it, it's probably the most enduring image of the last 20 years is that opening sequence and, you know, how close to the truth was it? Uh, very questionable. Well, it's such a big opening scene. I bet, I bet most people could tell you the scene, but most people can't remember the rest of the film. <laughs> What, what are the big holes in it? 
they drop the ramp and seven guys get shot with the same bullet. Didn't happen. They were too far away. Hanks is an experienced ranger captain. He has gold captain's bars on the front of his helmet. It's like, shoot me. Then they're in this, behind this small dune shooting the Germans. And one, the big heavy guy gets, oh, yeah, I got him. I got him. He stands up and gets shot. You don't stand up. You never stand up. You know, so there was a, a raft of things. And it, the whole thing progressed through the movie along the lines of a serious bunch of technical errors. The last one that really got me, I don't know how familiar you are with firearms. I don't know if you've ever fired a Colt 1911A1 pistol. The last thing in the world you ever do is try to fire it one-handed when you're not feeling well. And Hanks is wounded and dying, and he's one-handing this thing. Believe me, I don't one-hand it, and I'm really good. Uh, so there was a whole series of things that went on throughout the movie. The opening sequence, some of it, the men who were there say was good. I found, this is why I don't go to war movies, points that were sloppy technically, that didn't need to be sloppy. And I talked to men who was there, who were there. I talked to men from San Mario Glees. I talked to them Point Du Hoc, landing craft drivers, you know, the whole bit. A, a guy that ran my paper route was Army engineers out of Italy. They came back, got refitted, supposed to be the fifth wave at Omaha. He was the first. And I heard that when I was 12 years old. So that's my, my gripe. I'm sorry, Angus. Go ahead. Let's. <laughs> no, no. I, it's interesting because you know it is. It's held up as being you know the uh, you know the the gold standard of realism, isn't it? That that especially certainly that open scene because it, it, let's face it, there's not a lot of uh, narrative to to go wrong at. So people hold it up as that's what the experience like for these men sat on the boat and coming up the beach. Yes, dropping the ramp. No, you got about thirty seconds to a minute or two minutes of good footage. And the rest of the movie wasn't worth sitting there watching pop eating my popcorn. After I, I went to see it when it first that for, first came out, and then I realised well, after watching the introduction that I uh, the re rewatching the introduction, I'd I'd actually not seen it again because I, I think the story annoyed me so much I never wanted to go back. I, it had been quite an exciting film to watch at the time, just because I saw it in a really good theatre and and it had big sound and there was tanks driving behind me and stuff. So it was it was all sort of quite thrilling to watch. <laughs> um, um, that's all right. I'll 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 pass. I'm really really too old to learn what it's like to get shot at. <laughs> so we've looked at you know, we've looked at Europe. You know, how was it for the uh, the Americans in the Pacific? I mean, had the, did the Japanese pro approach defense the same as the Germans uh, against amphibian landing? The Japanese defense against landings evolved. You have to break this apart, and this is something I try to do in the book. You have the Pacific landings which I'll sort of lump Guadalcanal in with it because the Marines were there. You had Tarawa, which is a total unbelievable mess, uh, massacre. They had Anawea, Kwajalein, on up through the Gilberts, the Marshalls, Carolines, and eventually into Okinawa, uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. So a lot of that's been covered. The Japanese initially resisted the landings on the beach. They had to. Tarawa, there wasn't any room to go. Uh, the small island of Kwajalein on a Weok, again, no place to go. You had to fight pretty much to a point on the beach. When you got up into Peleliu, they changed their tactics. They let them land pretty much and then fought them in the caves. The classic is a lot on Iwo Jima, but the classic is the Philippines, where basically everybody got ashore in one piece, and the Japanese pulled back into immensely well-entrenched positions and just fought them to the death and beyond. It was a, a war of attrition. So the same in the, the Southwest Pacific, which was MacArthur's era, area, totally neglected by history. And that's too bad because, as you know, if you saw, there were an immense number of small landings. And a lot of the time, the Japanese, they, they were smart enough. They didn't, they didn't have to land where the Japanese were, which was one point. But when they, they the Japanese resisted fanatically, but not always on the beach. They would attack after the people were ashore, and they were really good at night infiltration, really good at doing that, and the Americans were so green that they, they actually wind up causing themselves casualties. You go up to Alaska, or the Aleutian, they were, the Americans pulled a landing on a deserted, basically an island had been evacuated or deserted by the Japanese, and all the casualties were self-inflicted. It's sad, but that's what happened. So the Japanese, again, evolved the defense. One was to throw them back in, throw them into the water, which was the German concept initially, uh, or the Vichy French in North Africa, the Italian and German 
thoughts in Sicily. Salerno and Anzio were contained them. They could the Americans could have gotten out of them very quickly, and they sat on their hands and didn't, and wound up encircled. And it was just a battle of attrition at that point that the Germans were not going to win. But they just kept at it because the you know why not cost the enemy as much as you can because then you don't have to fight that many people later. But the Japanese just it became an absolute war of attrition. Period. No matter what, kill them. Well, I wondered if. In the Pacific, when when uh, the U.S. are left to their own devices, they really get into the swing of how to do it, and they just don't mess about. It's just overwhelming firepower. Uh, and there's no trickery. There's no shenanigans. There's just, you know, as much as you can throw at it. You know, they used to call uh, when the the bombardments on the islands they used to call them Halsey haircuts, but the Japanese at the same time though would dig in. On the islands, I mean, you don't have any place to go on the islands. You're you're there. You're not going anywhere. They built incredible fortifications. You know, uh, coconut logs buried under sand. They built spider holes, networks underground. Iwo Jima was probably the ultimate of what they could do. The Japanese were very, very, very good. They have the only rule of engagement for the Japanese was kill them. No surrender. Use whatever method you have to do to kill the, as many Americans as you possibly can. So they used everything, and they were very effective. The one thing with, in the Pacific, though, is they, unfortunately, the Americans kept using the same group of people or groups, same Marine divisions, same Army divisions. They'd go through a battle. They'd come out, be reinforced, resupplied, and a year later, they're back at it in another place. Same type of fight. So they, they would build up a culture a cultural history of being of how to fight these battles. They'd still take casualties, but they had more experience than the Americans. They're very uh, okay. Europe's a good example. The first infantry division and several other divisions made multiple landings from North Africa on up. They were better off than the, these divisions where they were thrown into battle the first time in not so much Sicily but Anzio Salerno and particularly in Normandy, where we had a lot of people who had spent two two years in England. With no combat experience, I think, and I this is shooting from the hip, if you're part of the expression, their casualty rates, their learning curve, if you will, was a lot steeper because they didn't have the experience or the experienced personnel to survive through root, what became routine events for a lot of the, unfortunately, if you use the word routine, for a lot of Marines and a lot of Army personnel in the Pacific, and particularly in the Southwest Pacific. Well, it struck me as almost the the the, uh, the boats become also like just a taxi service, a means of delivery for these guys. It's as you say, they're small islands, so they just get on. And they must have some of them just must have gone from one landing to another, either opposed or unopposed. They did. I'll give you one example of a Coast Guard uh, attack transport, an APA Bayfield, and this is a minor example. She was at Utah, reinforced Omaha, Southern France. Iwo Jima and Okinawa, same landing craft drivers. There was LSTs in the Southwest Pacific that did 15, 20 different invasions. The crews got very good at what they did. Well, that's something else that most people don't appreciate. They're actually, I believe there's a shortage of landing crafts. So they did actually redeploy them re- literally round the world. They did. Well, that's what happened when we went into Anzio. Eisenhower said, well, okay, they said, well, you've got the landing craft and this many ships for X amount of time, and then we're pulling them out because we need them for Normandy. So that was a problem. Southwest Pacific was on the the tag end of the supply chain. So they were really in a lot of trouble. Uh, They had down there engineering special brigades, which I found out about. Phenomenal guys. They make the CBs look like Boy Scouts. And I like the CBs, and I'm going to have trouble with the CBs now, but they did an incredible amount of work that was not recognized, and they were in the Southwest Pacific almost exclusively uh, and kept a lot of boats going very innovative that would never never have been survived as long as they did. It was a lot of that type of work. The other thing that's overlooked is the tr- Commonwealth troops, the New Zealanders, the Australians, did a lot of work in the Southwest Pacific, and that was after, and you know, up in Borneo, after these poor guys had been hammered in the desert, came back and had to fight in the jungle against a wholly different, much more vicious enemy. And that's been really overlooked in history, which is too bad. So something else that I, I, I bumped into before, but I don't know much about that, that is clearly overlooked, is the, now, 
you might have you'll have to correct me on the name is they have the the australian are they coast watchers or oh yeah that were on the islands basically spotting and giving intel back to these guys uh, and local knowledge yeah felt uh, an australian felt set them up what they did what they went through was amazing yeah uh eric felt f-e-l-d-t set up the coast watchers before the war and ran them through the solomons and after the solomons they really became i won't say superfluous but they didn't need them but they were lifesavers and they were primarily like native policemen plantation owners really really uh an unusual mix but they they made a huge difference through the Solomons. I mean, how important was you know the idea of local knowledge? I got the feeling in the Pacific there was less um, preparation. You know, DD, uh, for example, they put a lot of effort into selecting the beaches of the right sand, and they looked at tides. And I mean, obviously, some of it went wrong, various other things. But you know, could they even go through to that level of uh, detail for the landings in the Pacific, or did they just say, you know, we need to go there, just throw a lot at it, and we'll get there? Well, no, they did actually a lot of preparation where they could. Guadalcanal, they picked the beaches. It was very interesting. We actually went in from the north side, not the south side. But they had a lot of information from people who had lived on Guadalcanal and, and Tulagi and Florida and Gavutu. They had that in, in a number of the other islands and a number of other places. They did in the central Pacific after Tarawa as much reconnaissance as they possibly could from there on up. The beaches in the Southwest Pacific, I don't think the reconnaissance was as extensive, but they would put these guys, UDT guys, underwater demolition teams ashore from submarines to check out beach gradients, the same type of thing they did at Normandy, but on a smaller scale. You know, you have to make sure you can get, if nothing else, your LVTs across, let alone tanks later on. You know, what's going on? So they did a fair amount of work. They did some aerial reconnaissance. The problem in the Pacific, one of the problems is the charts were so out of date. They find islands that were, you know, 50, you know, 25 miles from where they should be and pointed the wrong way. This was a problem. Now, it's sort of funny, but it's not. They did the reconnaissance, not as thorough as at Normandy, because the operations not only were smaller, but on a much narrower front. Yeah, they were, they were, they were relentless. Mm. They had to be. They got the information they could. Very few of these things were ad hoc. You mentioned uh, uh, the underwater demolition teams. I'd never heard of them before. You, 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 you touch upon them in the book. Uh, you know, how prevalent are they? What were they dealing with? How do they work? I mean, presumably, they, did they have um, oxygen tanks and things? Uh, aquagate, uh, sub- no, they came, the oxygen, actually, the, the lungs came in later with Jacques Cousteau. They all did snorkels. It was all snorkels. They actually came in after Tarawa in 43 in the Pacific. And then they used them, I found out, at, at Normandy a lot. But you always think of them in the Pacific, you know, the, you know, wearing the bathing suits, knife strapped to the hip, mask up over the head. But they, again, worked in much colder waters and did a lot of the beach reconnaissance and setting up to, to blow obstacles before somebody got to the beaches the day of the attack. But they were going into the beaches covertly along with other people uh before virtually every operation yeah i didn't realize they were also uh, you know also clearing you know in many respects uh, you know i think i said earlier you know, getting the men from ship to shore is relatively straightforward it's it's those uh nuts and bolts of the beach is so covered in wreckage that they have to bring tractors ashore in great numbers to clear the beach to get more men ashore. You know, a, a fascinating pieces of detail that just never covered. And if you, funny, if you see pictures of those beaches, you you nearly always see, a, you know, the, the bulldozer in the background. Well, the, the, the whole thing, and we go back to a cliche that amateurs talk tactics, logist, uh, professionals study logistics. I found, and other people I've talked with, find most of the books deal with either land battles or the major battles at sea. They don't deal with the convoys. They don't deal with the logistic chains or getting the 12th wave ashore on the beach. How'd that happen? How do you assemble the boats? How do you determine how many ducks, LVPs, LCPs, etc.? Do you need X number of men, Y number of things, and what's your loss ratio? And that's what makes or breaks it as well as the training for the men 
who literally have to be there when the ramp drops. Yeah, I know there was a vast array of uh, craft available to them to pick through. Presumably, a, 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 you know, a lot of the time it, they could only use what was available. See, when the craft themselves evolved to a point. The LCVPs didn't didn't evolve from 1942. This was it. Locked the design. The biggest changes I think came in some of the auxiliary craft, where the ducks were introduced in you know mid 43, made a huge difference because not only could they get to the beach, they could get beyond the beach, which was big. They didn't have to transship this stuff. They could put them in. The landing craft changed. They had landing ship docks with this huge, and basically the whole open back of the ship where they could load the landing craft, they could load the ducks, open the back doors, and the boats were in the water and headed to the beach. They didn't have to rely on the cargo nets over the side or loading the boats and then putting the boats down in the water. Big difference, but used primarily in the Pacific, not in the Atlantic. The, the, presumably the ducks were not so much used for the assault landings as were used for the follow-up waves of bringing uh, support ashore. Yeah, the ducks ducks were too slow, but you could load them up with a ton of supplies, or a ton is a, a figure of speech, and run them up on the beach, and run them a mile inland, and run them across the creeks or the bad sand. That's what made the ducks valuable, or use them, you know, transships stuff. They were not assault vehicles in any way, shape, or form. You know, the, the biggest invasion of the war never really happened, did it? The, the invasion of Japan. People don't understand. I've talked to Japanese who said the best thing that ever happened was we dropped the bomb. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. I mean, they were, you know, the Allies, just to hit the southern islands, were looking at 100,000 casually the first day or two. 100,000 the first few days. Astronomical. And that's before we got to the main islands. They were looking at war extending at least through 1948. And basically turning the whole Japanese chain of islands into a desert. It's frightening, isn't it? More so than dropping two atomic bombs. Yeah, absolutely. In their planning, had they? How much had they adapted from everything that they'd learned? Had they got anything new? Was there anything new into the mix when they when they were going to attack the actual Japanese mainland, or was it just scale? Scale. You can only do it certain ways. And Okinawa was a really good test run for it because they were running into terrain on a home island that they were going to encounter in Japan. Uh, probably of all the islands. Well, Saipan. Saipan was another almost disaster. The Japanese had literally driven part of the landing force back to the, the water's edge and into the water. So Saipan was a good run. Okinawa was the next step up. You can't, there's only certain ways. And they knew that the, they weren't going to be able to take out all the, the obstacles or the beach defenses. And it was going to be house to house. And you almost had to level the house and make sure the cellar was blown up because people were, everybody was going to fight you. Everybody. Absolutely frightening. I can't fathom what it took to be a landing craft driver to go in, run into the beach, go through the fire, load up wounded, come back, have them hauled out, wipe out your boat and go back in many times and do that multiple landings or the troops who did multiple landings one after another after another after another you know maybe six months apart maybe a year apart you know i i don't have an answer and fortunately i've never had to find out that answer no and under heavy fight be frightening as you said presumably it's not just a matter of getting in it's then getting off and then you have to turn around and maneuver off again and, and uh you know you're in a constant fire from shot and shell yeah running in i the the sheer courage i've talked to landing craft drivers who've done this are the guys manning the lsts through multiple landings it's it's a level of i want to say courage that that that, that seems like a shallow word to describe what these people did mm. well that seems like a, a fitting place to finish mike thanks mike's book is blood stained sands there are some great anecdotes in there, and unless you're really buffed up on landings during the war, there is a lot you won't be aware of. Mike does cover many of the smaller landings that rarely get a mention. I'll put a link on the website, and to make it easier, I've added a book section, uh, and you'll be able to find it there. You can find Mike and details of his other books at mikewalling.com. And don't forget, if you enjoy your coffee... You can show your support at patreon.com slash ww2podcast or hit the donate link on the website ww2podcast.com.